My name is May Lum. I'm the founder and director of The WOW Project, a community initiative using arts and culture and activism as a means to amplify voices and stories in our neighborhood in a time of rapid change. So tonight is all about the Homeward Bound series, Memory, Identity, Resilience across the Chinese diaspora. And we're really excited to be kicking off the series with our first event tonight called Chinatowns Around the World. Um, and it will be featuring Hui Ying. And I'm just going to read uh, a quick bio of Hui Ying, and then I'll hand it over to Hui Ying to kick us off. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, Hui Ying is a writer, multimedia storyteller, and aspiring healer from New York City with roots in the Toysanese diaspora. In 2016 through 2017, Hui Ying received the NAFL Fellowship to travel solo to Chinatowns in eight countries around the world, documenting global stories of migration and resilience across the diaspora. They are a current Open City Fellow at the Asian American Writers Workshop, covering stories of intergenerational arts and activism in Chinatown. Their writing has recently been published in Culture Push's Push Pull Journal, the Blue Shift Journal, and the Asian American Journal of Psychology. Huang has received fellowships and awards from the Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation, American Education Research Association, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Random House, and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Huang is passionate about Cantonese food and exploring the teachings of the universe, such as how parrotfish change genders multiple times throughout their lives and how millions of snowflakes together create storms. Thank you so much, and I'll hand it over to Huang to kick us off. Woo! Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to kick off the series. What I'm going to be talking about um, is my travels to Chinatowns in eight countries around the world in the past 2016 to 2017. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot to cover. And so I, I would say that um, as an audience member, uh, feel free to not hold back your emotions. And if something resonates with you, feel free to snap or clap. Or, or if you're tired of sitting, like feel free to stand up and stretch, um, I think. I want people to feel comfortable here and that you don't have to like hold things back. Um, a lot of what I'll be sharing is using uh, the writing that I did, so narrative pieces and poetry to kind of um, take you to the moment in these different countries um, because it's through writing that I see that as the best way to do that. So I'll start. Um, this is my journey in one year, uh, maps mm -hmm. out on a map. I started in New York City and then I went to Peru, uh, to Havana, South Africa, Johannesburg. And then I went to China, Guangdong, and different cities throughout China. And then I went south um, to Southeast Asia, beginning in Hanoi in Vietnam and then going to Ho Chi Minh City. And after that, making my way to Singapore and then Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And from Malaysia, I flew to Sydney, Australia and kind of traveled a little bit um, throughout Australia. And I think, um, why I chose these countries is, first of all, because of the long-standing history of Chinese migration in each of them that not a lot of people know about. I think um, from having studied Asian American studies, a lot of the history has really been like national focus within the borders of the US. But from my travels, I learned about how a lot of it is parallel globally, right? And so a lot of this route is also the Cooley route um, that indentured laborers uh, leaving Guangdong in the 1800s went on. Um, they left by boat in the hundreds of thousands to different countries when China was in a lot of political turmoil for opportunities elsewhere, um, having perhaps never heard of the country that they were going to, but knowing that it might bring better fortune um, than where they were staying in. And so a lot of Cooley ships uh, left from China and went to Peru and then dropped people off by the thousands and then dropped them off in Havana. And all of these countries had a lot of sugar plantations um, or just like plantation type work um, that they needed laborers for after the fall of slavery in a lot of these countries. And I guess first um, to give an introduction to the fellowship, um, it's a one year post-graduation fellowship that funds any project that you want to um, if you're awarded the grant. And so this entire project was designed really from my own creativity with it. Um, I thought if I had the chance to travel around the world, what do I want to be doing and how do I travel in a way that doesn't perpetrate harm in other countries um, coming from a Western country? And so 
why I chose Chinatowns Around the World um, is really because of um, two things, and I will talk about them through reading two pieces that I wrote. Um, so, so the first thing, um, I made this book in 2016. I learned book binding, um, and so this is like Asian style binding, um, and that's what I'll be reading from. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask people um, is, who in this room has ever been asked, where are you from? <laughs> and then when you give an answer, um, who has been asked, where are you really from? Yeah, like everyone. Um, it's really annoying, right? Um, and so um, I think, I'll just read. <laughs> when you ask me, where are you from? My body will jolt back a little. In that split second, my eyes gauge your intention. You will wonder if you've said something wrong. You have. You stumble. I mean, where is home? Where did you grow up? Your words no longer matter. You see, home is sometimes just an address. Home is the space between the name of a borough in New York and Google images of rice fields and cement homes, YouTube videos of farmers speaking Hoi San Ra. Home is Cypress Hill Cemetery, where the bodies of my great-grandfather, aunt, and uncle I never knew lie. It is where up on a hill a tombstone marks Po Po's body, buried next to an empty piece of land we brought early. We bought early so Gong Gong will lie next to her. Home is Tong Yang Gai, Chinatown. That greets me when I get off the six hour bus from Boston. On this gum spotted concrete, home is a memory. Of the summer I was in Chinatown, I could walk into the massage parlor and greet Yi Yi behind the counter after getting mango smoothies, Taiwanese pork chops with tea egg and rice, and waving at Yun from behind Xi'an famous foods. Home is a search. My father's obsession with looking at houses for sale in Staten Island because after we moved to Brooklyn, his cherry blossom tree, eggplants, tomatoes, string beans, and sunflowers never grew. But they rarely look with the intention of moving because there is always something not good enough about the home he sees. Until they can retire, until I make the six-digit salary, home remains temporary addresses and dreams. Home is the soft no. My mother replies when I ask her, can we go back to Toysan? In her answer, no, China has too many mosquitoes. It's too hot to go back, I hear. Don't make me remember home. The days I was young enough to play volleyball when I biked through the village and caught warm wind as I sped by rice fields, I've left that home behind. Let's just live from here. And so when you ask me, where are you from? I am no longer mad. I have long grown tired of anger, tired of fighting to defend America that will never be for me. The struggle for money is the one for happiness, is the one where not everyone in your family can win. And so in my rehearsed, casual, white English, I will say I'm from Brooklyn and hope to never see you again. Um, so, so that piece, I think, speaks to the greater questions I had about like where this home lies if it's neither in America and perhaps, or like maybe so in China, like in this in-between space that I've seen people talk about Asian America, like where is this home and what does it look like on a global level and where have my people been um, beyond like the New York City that I grew up in? And the second part that kind of um, triggered this trip um, was learning about all of the displacement that's happening in Chinatown. Um, so in the summer of 2015, I worked at CAV, Organizing Asian Communities, which is a nonprofit on Hester Street that uh, helps organize and actually organizes with um, immigrants um, to build the affordable housing movement in New York and to address issues of displacement that's happening rampantly. And I wrote this second piece when I was working there. He came into our office, shouting in Mandarin and showing me images I will not forget. His fingers scrolled to the photo of his uncle, wrinkled dark skin, white hair, sitting on top of a filled black garbage bag, head buried into his clenched hands. He lived in the basement of an apartment building on Broom Street, and when he came home, he found a sudden notice deeming it unsafe to live there. The landlord had illegally changed the locks of his apartment. He ran his heads, hands against the new lock in disbelief. He has cancer and needed the medicine he takes every four hours, or else he'd end up in the hospital. He called his nephew, screaming in Chinese to come help. His nephew called the NYPD, who took one look at him and said there was nothing they could do. 
So this man crumpled down onto the cracked pavement of a sidewalk that wasn't his and cried. This is America. This is the Empire State, the Big Apple, the melting pot of immigrants. That night he was hospitalized. They come into the office with stacks of documents, browning with age from the 1990s, saved in case they need to prove they are from here and have lived here. They come speaking Hakawa, Hoisanma, Fujinese, Cantonese, Mandarin, and together we try to piece their stories in this larger picture of the violence that has always permeated our communities. In the meetings, rallies, eating Joe Taiping, watermelon slices stretching wider than our faces, we fight for the city to be home. Over the last 15 years, Chinatown has lost over 15,000 apartments that are rent regulated and the Asian population has decreased um, by about 20% and even in the research studies, the white population is the only racial group that has grown in New York City's Chinatown um, in that same time period. And the same thing applies to places like Philadelphia, Boston, San Francisco. And so for me, I also wanted to do this trip because I was curious what Chinatowns in other countries looked like. Was gentrification something that was unique to Western countries with histories of colonization? Um, and what kinds of struggles and social issues were people and migrants in other countries facing. And so those are the two big catalysts for the trip. This is a visual of the places that I've been to. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot of photos. Um, it's so much to try to contextualize um, into a presentation, but I will say that um, I chose a lot of these countries based on that original history that I had mentioned, but also personal interest in them. And so a place like Cuba, US tourists are banned from going there, but you can go for research. And I was really curious also um, about the types of government that ran in Cuba and what it was like for people to live and follow values of a communist socialist state. And I was super curious about the Chinatown there because it used to be one of the largest in Latin America and is now one of the like smallest or smaller ones after um, the Cuban Revolution. I went to South Africa. I was also really interested in that because of the history of apartheid. Um, I had studied ethnic studies and I had learned during my time there that um, the apartheid government set up apartheid by learning about what was and wasn't working in segregation in the United States so that they can improve it and kind of build it into something even more powerful since um, it was starting at a time they were starting apartheid at a time when segregation in the US was waning, and so they were kind of like learning from that to build it. Um, and in, this, in kind of the same vein, um, the, like, the occupation of Palestine right now is also tied to apartheid, um, and people, a lot of people have been saying how the occupation of Palestine and what people are doing there um, to the local population is kind of like testing grounds for this like newer form of like imperialism and colonization, right? And so I was drawing connections between all of those countries and all of those histories. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go into each of these countries in depth. Um, more so focused on these three because there's a lot of material from there and then a lot of thoughts about Asia and Australia. I started in Peru. I arrived there and felt super overwhelmed um, that I was embarking on this year-long project by myself. Um, I had planned about, like, not much of it. Um, I had only a general <laughs> idea. I had a general idea of where I'd be going up until the third country, but then after that, there was really no way um, to like map out the whole route and to like plan everything in advance. And so I showed up in Peru, and I had previously emailed. Um, the Chinese Peruvian Association, I had like one contact, I knew where I'd be staying in a homestay, um, renting the room of a Peruvian woman there. Um, and there was just like a, a steep learning curve. Um, new currency, speaking entirely in Spanish, uh, which I had studied previously, and then navigating public transportation because I didn't want to be that like 
American that goes there and like Ubers everywhere. Um, and so I was I was learning about their bus system and it's like their bus system is actually it's seemingly complicated, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, the names of the neighborhoods that it goes to is on the side of the bus, and there's maybe like you know seven buses that come along, and so if if, if one of them is going to your neighborhood, you just kind of like wave at them. Um, and this man is kind of like screaming the destinations and you just gotta like get on it. Um, and they don't really stop. You just like, <laughs> you gotta try to catch the bus. Um, and I, I was like trying to do that um, while like not standing out, right? And so I was just like trying to blend in, um, which was really hard. Um, but one thing that I had previously read about Peru and Lima was that there was a huge Chinese influence there. Um, specifically um, in that history that I talked about, but also um, in the capital city, there are over 5,000 chifas. Um, they call, in Spanish, they call the Chinese restaurants chifas. And where that comes from is the Mandarin word, Mandarin word for chifan. Um, and so there's, there's a story that um, there was a, a coolie laborer and he was going off um, to get, like after the end of the day, and people kept asking him like, where are you going? Um, and they didn't, the Spanish people and the Chinese people didn't share the same language, so he would always be like, chi fan. And so eventually, the story goes that that's how the word chifa came about. Um, so what was really interesting for me while I was in Peru was also looking at the language. Um, for words like soy sauce, um, in, Cant in Cantonese you say ciao. In Spanish, they said ciao, and they spelled it S-I-L-L-A-U. Um, because in Spanish the L is pronounced with the, a Y, right? <laughs> and so people are speaking Cantonese in their everyday Spanish, but they don't necessarily know about that history. And people also say that everybody cooks with <coughs> Chinese ingredients like spring onions and ginger, but it's become so ingrained in the culture that it's just part of it, right? And so kind of the, the greater story of what's happening and what has happened in Peru is just this integration of Chinese people um, into like what today is a really multiracial community with, of people with Chinese heritage um, in addition to more recent immigrants. This is the Chinatown. I went here on my second day and as soon as I got here all of those feelings of like being super anxious and nervous um, suddenly like went away more because there was a Chinatown here. Um, I think like having been born here I don't know what it's like to immigrate and I don't know any of those feelings but being a traveler in all of these different countries like gave me that sort of like tip of the iceberg sentiment of what it could be like and so I immediately felt calmer going to Chinatown and I was walking through um, the main street here through the arches, it's called Calle Capon, and there are Chinese pastries, uh, Chinese restaurants, Chinese supermarkets, just like a lot of the goods that you would find here in New York City. So um, with this project, I would say that everything was really up in the air. Um, I had that main contact with the Chinese Peruvian Association, but kind of a theme in each of these countries was sort of just going to Chinatown and talking to people. And so I would be the solo traveler who walked into restaurants and uh, sat down and like was super interested in the lives of the people who were like the cooks and the cashiers. And um, that was kind of a theme. I think sometimes people thought I was weird. Like <laughs> imagine, imagine someone here just like walking in all of the different Chinese shops and just like asking questions. Um, that's kind of the approach that I took. But like me being Chinese, I think people were more like accepting of that and just like willing to talk to me. Can you go to the one after first? Yeah. Yeah. Are we doing a lot of task questions or? <laughs> uh, you can ask clarifying questions, yeah. but try to try to keep them for the end. In what language do you speak to them? In yeah, so in Chinatown, there's a lot of recent migrants, uh, recent as in maybe like the last 15 years, and so I would be speaking in Cantonese. And then for people who had been there for generations, I was speaking to them in Spanish. So these are young people from the Chinese Peruvian Association. And kind of their stories, um, 
After I had emailed the Chinese Peruvian Association, they invited me to a youth group meeting. Um, but youth is like really loosely defined. It's like people who are 20 <laughs> to 40, I would say. <laughs> um, and so I um, get invited to this cultural meeting, and I'm super nervous because I know it's at someone's house, and I don't know anything about this city, and so I just like am afraid that I'll die or something. Um, but for the sake of the project, I end up going to the meeting, and I, I, because I don't know anyone, right? And I'm just traveling by myself, and I, I walk in, and it's someone's living room, and people are really nice and friendly, because they're also people who are super interested in Chinese culture and the preservation of culture, and also, like how it evolves with the generations. And so with them, a lot of them are second to fourth generation. Everyone is uh, multiracial, and the thing about Peruvian identity is it's not only like Chinese and Peruvian, but people have Japanese heritage, um, indigeneity, Afro-Latinx, um, so like all of that is in when I talk about Chinese Peruvian. And so um, with them, I not only got a better understanding of what being Chinese Peruvian in Lima and growing up like that is like, but I also gained like a sense of like community with people that I could hang out with. Um, can you go back? Yeah, so <laughs> at the same time that I was doing all of that, I found, <laughs> how do I explain this? Um, I, I just heard one day that there was Tai Chi in the park near my house, the, where I was staying, and I'm someone who really likes Tai Chi. Um, I've mm -hmm. even like gone to sessions here um, with someone named Alex Hing, who's really cool. And I, so I go to these Tai Chi classes. <laughs> it's for, it's, it's mostly elderly people because doctors in Lima tell elderly folks that Tai Chi is really good for your health. And so all of these Peruvians who don't have any Chinese heritage are starting to do Tai Chi <laughs> and going to these lessons. And so like, I walk in and they're just super excited and happy to see a young person who is Chinese <laughs> like wanting to do Tai Chi with them. Um, and so I end up going to like practices with them, <laughs> really just for fun. And like one day we they decide that um, we should perform in the mall nearby. <laughs> oh so I just like agreed to go with them. Um, and I think like what I learned from this is like new Tai Chi moves and also just like the, the prevalence of Chinese culture in Peruvian society. Um, the teacher over there told me that had I stayed longer, she would have trained me for competition. <laughs> and so I think in another life, I would be a Tai Chi master. <laughs> Yeah, so the teacher learned in Peru, and then she traveled to China to study with someone. And actually, Tai Chi is huge in Peru. They have a national, they had like this international competition coming up where people from other countries, like not, that are not China, compete in them. So in Peru, these Chinese Peruvian young people are really defining this identity for themselves called Tusan. Um, Tusan comes from the Mandarin uh, Tusheng, which means like local born or from this land. And so that's where the Spanish comes from. And they're kind of trying to claim this Tusan identity because there's been so much discrimination from the monoracial Chinese people in Lima not wanting Tusanes to be part of their associations or part of their like cultural events. Um, this is something that's been common throughout other countries. It's this very like outdated view of like who is and isn't part of the culture. And so um, they just felt excluded, which is why the Chinese Peruvian Association was formed in the first place. And so with them in this past year, they really started this momentum to try to get Tucson as an identity on their census, on their national census. So while there's Tucson, there's also a Spanish word for people who are Chinese from China who are monoracial, and it's Paisanos. And so these people are Paisanos. But these people are also um, my uncle's 
classmates from middle school in Khoisan. <laughs> and I was in Peru, and my uncle texted me on WeChat that he has a classmate who went to Lima to open a Chinese restaurant. And I was like, wow, I really have to meet him, because that's directly in line with what I'm doing. So I contact these people on WeChat. And I think um, my family being from Toysan, there's this really um, community familial feeling for anyone who's Toysanese, and they just kind of treat you like you're part of the family, even though you're not related. And so they kept insisting that I stay with them. Um, and so I did. <laughs> um, and I, like with them, they live in a part of Lima that other people say is sketchy um, for whatever reason that might mean but it was a working class area um, where people like thought was dangerous and so it was really interesting for me to kind of like live with them and see what their lives were like they had been here for eight years and I think like with them and with a lot of other people um, who try to immigrate to America or Canada kind of like Latin America is a better alternative than doing nothing if you can't get into America and so like with them they've been here for eight years but their ultimate goal is to get to the US or Canada um, but I wouldn't say I wouldn't generalize that to every Chinese immigrant that's in Lima um, and so when I was with them um, I also learned about the tensions that exist between the Chinese Chinese Peruvians and then the Chinese and the Peruvians um, because the, they they still call Peruvians like Guaylo, and I had previously only heard that term uh, for like what immigrants call white people in America, right? But I didn't realize that it's just anybody who is not your race, and so that's what they were calling um, other Peruvians. And they they had like very stereotypical views of Peruvians, um, which Peruvians know that Chinese people have, and so I was just like navigating both of those worlds with these identities that allow me to be in both of those worlds and like seeing that. Um, so for me, I, I think like one of the, oops, there's more, just kidding, can you go, can you go one more? Yeah, so with my new friends, <laughs> we actually went on a road trip <laughs> that one of them planned. Um, this really wasn't the case for every country, I just got super lucky that these people were so nice. Um, we drove to a place called uh, Paracas, and it's a place um, outside of the capital city, just another area that has really become a tourist destination because uh, people can take like cruises on the waters and the, there's really pretty islands to see. But what is also really interesting about Paracas is that these islands are the original islands that the coolies were brought to to work in. Um, so you have all of these tourists going there and taking really like happy and nice pictures and then there's this dual history. Um, <laughs> Hence the seriousness of me <laughs> over there. <laughs> but, <laughs> so like, what these are, are there are these really barren islands filled with birds. All of those are white birds. And um, people have hired or contracted laborers to kind of like scoop the dirt that is there that the birds have pooped on because it makes for really great fertilizer. And it's called guano in Spanish took me forever to figure out what guano was. I was like, wait, what is guano? <laughs> so that's guano. And that's the history of what a lot of coolies were bought there for. Like, it was the plantations, and it was also just, like, doing guano and, like, mining the guano for fertilizer. Um, so it was really eerie for me to be able to go here and to see that without any marker of that history currently. This is just a fun picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> nearby, uh, we drove on the sand dunes and went sandboarding. Um, but I would say in summary, like what I learned from my time in Lima is um, it, it really expanded my understanding of what it means to be Tucson and Chinese American. I think because in New York City, like they have asked me this too, like are there also multiracial Chinese Americans that you're a part of? and like the honest answer is no, like the communities that I'm part of in Chinatown is very monoracial Chinese American that don't share this, um, this like the history that they have. But at the same time, there's probably, there are and there are probably a lot more like multiracial, multiracial like Chinese American folks who don't feel a part of like the monoracial Chinese American spaces. 
Um, and then I also learned from them just like the importance of cultural preservation, even for people who are like in the fourth generation, um, and to see how my deep understanding of where is home and what is my family lineage in China resonates with people who I had never met before in Peru. After Peru, I went to Cuba, and Cuba, um, at the height of the Chinese population in Cuba in the 1870s, there was about um, 40,000 people, and a history that I had learned there that I had never heard of was that thousands of Chinese people fled the U.S. to go to Cuba to escape xenophobia during Yellow Peril um, in the late... 19th century and I didn't know about that history and I didn't know that um, before the Cuban Revolution and after there was such a drastic difference in the Chinatown today Cuba's or Havana's Chinatown is a predominantly black community um, where there are very few evidently Chinese people in the entirety of Cuba there's less than 120 Chinese from China, which they in Spanish called Chinos Naturales, which means natural Chinese. But there are thousands of mixed race descendants. This is the streets of Chinatown. Um, there really is no indication of things that are Chinese um, because after the revolution, um, the government took back all private businesses. And so the restaurants were taken back, um, private property was redistributed supermarkets eventually closed um, just like everything was gone right and so for the first time I saw how much the prosperity of Chinatown is tied to capitalism which I hadn't made that clear connection before being here um, and so like like in Peru um, I had one contact in Cuba and because the internet is really limited um, I didn't have like reliable email communications with them and so what I did was I lived in a room in uh, someone's apartment in in Havana's Chinatown and on my first day there I walked like one street down and I stopped here at the Minchi Tang Association because I had heard that there was someone there I could talk to and so um, he ended up being a leader in one of the Chinese Cuban associations there and he connected me with everyone else that I would further meet one place that I really found a lot of community was in this um, senior center slash food kitchen place. Um, it's called La Casa de los Abuelos, which is grandparents' house, but it's not what you would see in a senior center here. It's just kind of a place that provides meals and support for Chinese descendants whose last names fall under the Lung Kong Association. Um, so the associations in Havana were by last names, um, which is different from Peru or other places where it's by region. Um, so here I got to know a lot of the elderly and um, they were also very happy to see a young person who was interested <laughs> in their culture. Um, just because like in Havana Chinatown a lot of the elderly are the ones leading efforts to preserve the associations um, after everything had left, after the supermarkets had left, um, because the young people are um, occupied looking for better economic opportunities perhaps elsewhere in the country or just like in other places throughout the country. One of the best times that I had here was when I went to Chinese lessons in the Minchi Tang Association. And what I found really special about it was that everybody was over the age of 65 and they were learning Mandarin for the first time because they wanted to connect to their heritages and to be able to speak um, to relatives in China, like should they ever be connected in the future. And so with them, um, I had studied Mandarin for two years, which was useful um, in like helping like teacher facilitate the classes. Um, because here, the teacher who is Ramon, he's born and raised in Cuba, and he had never formally studied Chinese Mandarin. And so he was just kind of teaching um, from his own knowledge. And so he really appreciated the support. Did you tell us what the surnames were of the, did you tell us? No, um, but one of them is Lee, another one is Lao, and then there's three more that I can't remember off the top of my head. And then did they um, mostly speak in Spanish? They all spoke Spanish. And the, but in terms of uh, the, you know, um, sorry, 
great grandparents' tongues. Were they Tuisanese? I mean, not mm-hmm. Tuisanese, sorry. Were they from um, Guangdong province? Yeah, so almost all of the elderly, uh, which is like 50 to 70 in La Casa de los Abuelos, they have their roots in the Guangdong province. Mm. And so these are the ones who are multiracial descendants, but there is also um, Chinos Naturales who still speak Cantonese, and so I also spoke with them. Um, but I would say that like this group of people were more enthusiastic to like be involved in my project um, more than like the other Chinos Naturales were. And you're learning Mandarin? Or? They're learning Mandarin. There was Cantonese a while ago, um, but it had stopped, and I think that's related to um, Mandarin being the official language of China and then its worldwide presence of only teaching Mandarin and so I think it trickled down to the population here even though they all really want to learn Cantonese. So this was really my entry point to being able to connect with people who I interviewed a month after I had um, been living and going to Chinatown every single day. I think um, the best thing is for me to share a clip and then maybe their stories. Um. Oh. Will it play without speakers? May I can talk more about yeah. the other people if you just open it? <coughs> Can you go back one? Do you want to get speakers? No. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I was going to tell you about them anyways. Um, so this is uh, Georgina and Caridad. And they were born and raised in Cuba with at least one relative um, who is Chinese, uh, whether that is a grandparent, like one grandparent, or like one of their two parents. And I was really interested in talking to them because they performed in Cantonese opera over the past decades and have even traveled to China to perform. Back when Chinatown was one of the biggest in Latin America, there was three theaters there, at least three, and it was filled with, uh, when I see pictures, it was filled with audiences who were Chinese men um, there to work and they were bachelors, kind of like the bachelor societies that were here in this Chinatown. Um, and they were just there on the weekends to see Cantonese opera, and there was enough of a audience and population to be able to have that. All of that changed after the revolution, but they still sing amongst themselves. And Georgina, even though she doesn't speak Cantonese, she can sing in Cantonese. <laughs> wow. And Caridad learns <coughs> Cantonese entirely by herself through opera songs. Um, and like from one of her parents who had introduced Chinese to her. But I was super interested in their histories um, that weren't really documented anywhere. And um, Maria del Carmen over there in the top, that, that corner, um, she is a who I would call like the historian of Chinatown, but an unofficial historian. So it's not her job or anything, but she's been asking like friends, friends of friends for pictures of when they were younger in Chinatown or of their families. And so over the decades, she just collected this huge um, photograph archive of uh, all of that history. Um, and so she was really interested in talking to me because we're both like these historians, I guess. Um, and you know she'd be the one sending all of these books in Spanish to me to read about the Chinese Cuban history, and also just taking me to different sites throughout the city that had a presence of um, Chinese people there. Whether it, it's like big um, open air markets that have since closed down, um, that her father had had a fruit stand in, um, to just like other sites in the city. And so um, one of the interviews that I'm going to share a snippet of is. Um, the woman who was on this corner, and she is talking about um, what her memories were of Chinatown when it was prospering. It's good? Yeah. Um, May, it can also play from the PowerPoint. And so this is a short clip, um, but to give you context, um, 
she talks about remembering how there were fondas in Chinatown. And so fondas are what what eating establishment is there before a well fleshed out restaurant that has like tablecloths and things like that. A fonda is something that was really common there that's just like super simple. Um, maybe it's like one long table and people come in and eat and there's no menus and um, they serve like fresh vegetables. It's kind of like a really um, low key restaurant before restaurants kind of proliferated, um, if that makes sense. And um, I think that's all the context you need for her interview. But there were a lot of here. Oh, yes, there were about five. I remember that they were very good and very quick. Oh, this barrio had a lot of people coming out and coming out. And what did you eat in the past? Oh, my God. Chow mein, chow mein, chow mein, chow mein, chow mein, chow mein, chow mein. Eh, una sopa que es así como, como de maíz y eh, eh, a, a, de mi sopa de mariposita otra que tiene, se le echaba un huevo un huevo crudo así el huevo así yo no sé cómo le llaman porque yo iba y yo comía pero yo, no, no. y el arroz frito especial rico rico con camarones pollo carne ahumada el choricito Ay, chorizito chino, Dios mío. Ay, más nunca he podido volver a comerlo. Cuando veo Shanghai así, que tiene afuera los mercados llenos de ensalta de chorizo. La boca se me hace agua. <ríe> Rico, sí, como lo. Bueno, ese es el Pacífico, lo mejor que había. Un restaurante muy bueno. Y, y bueno, ahora sí no hay. Sí, sí, hay algunos, una flor del otro, bueno, eso es un de ahora. Y mucha pizza. Sí, <risa> mucha pizza. Ay, Dios mío. So, uh, what really stands out to me from having spoken to her and a lot of other people is just like how strongly this memory of like Chinese food is and how strong Chinese food is tied to culture and how strong I guess like parents and family members express love through Chinese food right and so for me um, I guess it was all the more sad that um, they haven't been able to eat Chinese sausage um, since like the 1960s um, right and and so like I, I came back and I was speaking to someone in Chinatown about that. I was like, they can't, they don't, they haven't had chi like bop chung in so long or like hot <laughs> or any of the dim sum. And me and my friend were just like really sad for them. Um, and I think like in the entire time that I was in Cuba, it was really strange because for me it showed what Chinatown would look like if it was deprived of all of its previous institutions and everything that you see in this Chinatown, um, like what it would look like without all of that. And so I, I was kind of like, I don't know, I, I don't want to call it post-apocalyptic, but like <laughs> there's like all this talk about um, Chinatown here being gentrified and losing so many of its um, like key institutions, right? And so to walk in Havana and to see a Chinatown having lost all of that and the elderly population being really sad about it and just remembering what eating dim sum was like when they were children with their families. Um, it provided a lot more depth of feeling for what the fight in New York City and across the U.S. Um, against gentrification, like, like all of the emotions behind that and really what's at stake. Uh, so I'll end my time um, talking about Cuba by reading something I wrote. Actually, I'm going to read... I'm going to read, um, wow, okay, I'm going to read two things. Um, uh, this is all just like raw material from my notebook, and now that I'm back, I'm trying to make sense of and process like all of the notebooks that I have and what I'm going to do with this, um, but here's raw writing. I would do it for you. If I could, I would bring all of the packs of lop churn in the supermarkets to you. I would treat you to meals of tasiu, hagao, siu mai, and all the kinds of bao exactly as you remember. 
If I could, I would rebuild the aisled seats in the theater and fill the crowds with children, mothers, grandmothers, and families to hear your song. I would clean the sidewalk ledges so you could sit on the corner with your Chinese newspaper. I would stock your kitchen cabinets with tiger bomb, Chinese herbal medicines, and in another time, your souls would be filled with your food and memories would not only be a source of lastima and regret. Your children wouldn't have had to immigrate. You wouldn't fall in your home. You would have a house that the government paid the bills of. In another time, the streets would be paved. The elevator in your building would work so you can go to events and you would not have to be hungry. In another time, you'd be able to have it all. I wish you could come with me. I wish you could come with me and I wish you could see that the dream you have is alive and well and thriving in another part of the world. Gong Gong Po Po Ye Ye Mama, I wish you could see that all that you dreamed of creating, of living, of being, is alive and well in New York's Chinatown, in, San, in San Francisco. The parks are filled with children running after each other laughing. A grandpa is lifting his grandson to touch the monkey bars and walking him along as a child's hand touches each one proud. A grandmother sits at the bench, soft smiling, as her granddaughter's pigtails bouncing, jumps on the keys that create music. In her arm is a plastic white bag with a brown paper bag inside holding kanji. I am sorry that for you, these realities are only memories decades old. I'm sorry that oxtail soup is but a memory. I wanted to show a video of um, a grandparent singing, but I don't think we have time. Oh, yeah, we should move on, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll post it on a future website that I create, <laughs> that I am currently thinking of. Um, so, welcome to Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, Chinatown is one street long um, that stretches about three blocks. Um, that's as big as it's been, but it's been more populated in the past um, than it is now. But these are just like a row of shops um, that are still in Chinese uh, with like staple dim sum restaurants um, and Chinese food places that the local Chinese South African population has always been going to. Chinatown in South Africa, um, everybody calls it Malekam, um, which translates to Malay Street, and it's because before Chinatown was Chinatown, it was a place where Malaysian miners lived uh, when they came to work in South Africa. And um, this neighborhood kind of has a stigma to it. Um, under apartheid, the Chinese population was classified as colored uh, because they were neither white nor black and so the government didn't really know where to put them and so they just put them in the middle in the colored section um, with other Indian folks. Um, so they kind of just went to their separate institutions um, like schools, they lived in their own neighborhoods of just monoracial Chinese South African people that had been there for a couple generations now. and. For me, that explained a lot about um, why the South African Chinese population is largely monoracial. Um, yeah, it's because they were legally barred from interacting with other races, and then kind of over time, um, talking to them, I saw how the thinking of racial hierarchy um, still like manifested and held true in their minds um, and manifesting to things like anti-black racism um, or thinking that Chinese are kind of higher um, than other like racial minority groups. Um, yeah, and so the main story I want to tell here is the one of Diane here. And I have, so, so Diane is um, part of this family who has a lot who has had a lot of leadership um, in the Chinese South African Association, specifically through the Transvaal Chinese Association. Um, Transvaal is the name just for like a large region um, in Johannesburg or around. It's just like the name of a place. And um, what Diane did was really incredible um, because starting in the 1980s and then over the course of 10 years, um, she and 
Melanie, co-wrote this book that detailed and documented Chinese South African history for the first time. Um, this didn't exist before they set out on their oral histories, um, traveling throughout Johannesburg to interview people and to interview different arms of the Chinese Association that united the community there. And so with them, I learned about their organizing um, under apartheid and after, and their work to make sure that the Chinese South African community also had reparations when apartheid ended, um, to recognize that they were also disadvantaged and um, like suffering during this time. So I'll leave this up here for anyone who wants to see it later. It's like currently out of print um, because it was so popular and like everybody bought a copy um, and it just never went back in print. Um, so this is one of, I guess, like the few copies that exist. So in addition to that history, um, there's this whole other history of Chinese immigrants coming to Johannesburg to set up their own businesses. Um, these people had largely come within the last 15 years, and there is in turn a new Chinatown um, that exists in a suburb of the city. And the suburb is called Cyrildine. And in my time there, um, I suddenly went from speaking mostly English to the Chinese South Africans to speaking in Chinese. And I specifically sought out uh, Toy Sanese people, which I found here. Um, they're a brother and sister from Toy San who immigrated there to sell bamboo. And um, they have a really huge bamboo business and the people next to them um, are running a bakery. And so with them, um, I learned a lot about the tensions that exist between the Chinese South Africans who have that history of apartheid who call themselves locals and this new population who the locals call overseas. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, a lot of the locals think that the overseas Chinese um, are dirty or they're tarnishing the reputation that the community has spent so many decades to build up. Um, so there was a lot of that tension um, that existed. Do they mostly speak Mandarin or Cantonese? Yeah, so um, it's both. I think that they're, it's both and it's mostly Mandarin. Do you know where? Northern China. And Fuzhou. <laughs> um, so with both communities, like I heard all of the stereotypes that existed about each other and then also just like the racism that was still prevalent and existing, um, but I also like <coughs> grew community with them as well, and they invited me to like have dinners with their families. Um, and I think like one thing that I was really looking for when I was in Johannesburg was what I see in America, which is the Asians for Black Lives movement and all of that conversation about the roles of Asian Americans in Black Lives Matter and like what role we have um, in that. But I was looking for that here and I didn't really find it, um, th which doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it's not, I would say that it's not as, um, prevalent as I see it here. <laughs> so after um, South Africa, um, I think, so half a year had passed, right? And I had another half a year left. And this was much less planned than the first three countries. And so things got a little more, I guess like, moving with things on the fly, but also having an idea of what I wanted to do. And so I went back to China and I lived there for about two and a half months. Um, the first month I was traveling throughout different cities um, that included um, Beijing, Hong Kong, oh, Hong Kong. Um, no, I meant to say Shanghai. Um, <laughs> Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou. Um, I also went to Hong Kong separately. And um, I was really just like getting to know China and like what is in China um, that I previously like didn't have the opportunity to do. And um, one of the things that I spent the second month doing was going back to Toisan and doing a family roots tracing. Um, I had the names of two and then it grew to four of the villages that each of my grandparents are from. Um, 
Uh, I'm the first generation born here, so we're not that far removed, but all of what was part of village life um, was like super foreign to me. And so I met my mom's classmate from elementary school welcomed me to their home in Toysan. And um, the father of my, of my mom's classmate, um, the, like the dad, who I called grandpa, uh, took me to the different villages because he was really familiar with the area and how to navigate um, areas of China. And so I was looking a lot for the zupus or the zhongpos, which are these genealogical books that a lot of villages in southern China have that document your family's uh, last name lineage over the generations, so like over 25 generations, right? Um, I found one of them. And this is the Guan Zupu, um, so my paternal grandmother's side. But when I got there, he located my grandma's family's name on page 1112. Oh. And when he opened to it, I was really excited. And then all of a sudden I realized her name is not there. And then he said to me, only the men's names are documented. And I was so mad <laughs> um, and had so many feelings about how women are erased from like Chinese history under Chinese patriarchy. Mm. And um, <laughs> so I kind of talked to him about that. <laughs> Not really though, um, but he said that um, newer Zupus are adding in the names of daughters, but it just still makes me really mad that they just erased all of that history of like the wives and all of the daughters as if they didn't matter because they don't carry on the last name. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll be more brief about the following countries. Um, I went to Vietnam and I studied uh, Vietnamese in Hanoi for about a month out of my own interest and out of, I think, like the need to learn the language to be able to navigate a country where um, people don't speak English, um, which they like shouldn't and don't have to. And so I kind of like learned um, beginner Vietnamese and it was really interesting because there is so much Cantonese influence um, in some words in Vietnamese and then that exposed me to the long legacy of what is uh, Chinese colonization in Vietnam that I had not known about before. Um, so just like centuries of that and centuries of like that history um, and you see it really lingering in the north um, even though there are really few Chinese people there um, there are so many different temples that have Chinese characters um, that I visited um, but there was not many people I could really talk to about the project until I went to the south May can you go to the next slide um, <laughs> these are just friends I made along the way um, can, can you go to the next one? Uh, before that, before that. Uh, so uh, after my time in the north, I went to the south, um, to Ho Chi Minh City, where there are f like five districts of Chinese Vietnamese people um, who are called Hoa, um, H-O-A. I really forget the history of that. I, I think it might be related to Hoa Ren, um, which means like diaspora Chinese people. Um, so there was no clear Chinatown for me to visit and things became a lot more murky, murky in terms of the project. Um, but like one thing I really loved learning about was how because there is such a huge population of Chinese folks, there are all of these efforts to preserve Chinese dialects in the South that I had not known about before such as um, all of these dialects classes. And so I went to the um, Tuto Wa classes and the Bujanese classes, um, which is pictured here, um, just to like talk to the teacher in Chinese. Um, she spoke Cantonese because so many people um, in the South have roots in Guangdong. And because they grow up around each other, they just learn Cantonese, even if they're not from Guangdong. <laughs> um, so I spoke to her in Cantonese. And um, she was just telling me about efforts to preserve the dialect and how important that was. And for me, that was um, really crucial. Uh, having grown up speaking Toysanese and seeing how that's lost over the generations, but not seeing uh, Toysanese classes in this Chinatown. 
I also went to traditional Chinese instrument classes um, that were was located in District Five, which is where the biggest population of Chinese Vietnamese are. Um, and so, just like young people who are interested in learning traditional Chinese instruments and performing and touring the country, um, I got to see how that was happening and how that happens, even though I never know that it happens. Um, it was it was really cool for me to see. <laughs> so after that, I went to Singapore, and uh, why I wanted to go to Singapore was because um, Chinese people are such a huge majority there, like over 70%, and most of the government is um, Chinese. And so for me, um, all of this shift in Southeast Asia was seeing what it was like, wh what, what it's like when Chinese people are in power, like regardless of issues um, that they face with racism in the Latin American countries that I went to. And so in Singapore, I saw how like the Chinese government um, treated its like immigrant workers really badly, like immigrant workers from Southeast Asia doing domestic work um, from Bangladesh, and just how that like power dynamic is perpetrated no matter what race, um, if these people are in the majority and in power. I also got to go to Chinatown and learn about the history through this like beautiful mural that is near Chinatown but not in Chinatown and meet the artist um, named Yip Yu Chong and um, he just told me about like his inspirations for these works and for preserving that and wanting to create more murals such as of Cantonese opera that used to be here um, that the government has uh, not permitted him to do since. Um, so I had to go to Malaysia because I was, because I went to Singapore, um, which like has that long-standing history um, that's like sort of complicated. Um, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, I randomly walked into a bookstore one day um, that I had, that had been recommended to me by a friend, and I met um, these people, and I learned about how the Chinatown in Kuala Lumpur was also facing issues of gentrification, with the government wanting to build things like a second subway line that's not really needed or to develop high rises and luxury development and how people were organizing against that. And so when I was there, they invited me to share about what was happening in New York City. And I specifically talked about um, what CAV was doing and what the Chinatown Art Brigade was doing. And so it was just like a, a moment for uh, this um, exchange of people who otherwise would have to dig really deep to find that news that was happening. And then finally, I ended in Australia. Um, in Australia, like by the time I got here, I was kind of tired of talking about uh, Chinese people 24-7 and just like thinking about race and, and like all of that. And it was actually a good thing um, because in Australia, uh, two things happened. Um, the first that I'll talk about since there's a picture is I reunited with this great aunt who I never met before. Um, but, like, my family members knew that we had a great aunt there on my maternal grandpa's side um, who has visited New York before, but I just never met her. And so this was my chance to meet her, and we hung out, and she took me out to eat. Um, <coughs> and I connected with my cousin, who has an Australian accent, um, who I had never met before, and it was really nice. Um, she showed me around and all of the different suburbs that are in Australia. And then the second big thing I want to talk about is learning about indigenous resistance that is has a huge legacy and current presence in Australia, specifically in Sydney where I was. I think immediately I learned that Sydney is really Gadigal lands um, of the Eora Nation because there is this huge um, custom of doing land acknowledgements and welcome to countries even at like immigration official government ceremonies, like there's just this huge presence of that that I don't see here much at all, but that people are trying to get. And for me as an outsider coming in, that really shaped my understanding of the indigenous lands and immediately connected me to wanting to learn more about this history. And so I got really lucky because at the same time that I was there, there was this um, photography exhibit in the University of Sydney of indigenous resistance. Um, it was called Down the Barrel and it's this 
photographer's work who actually is from America, but she moved there in the height of the civil rights movement um, to Australia to kind of escape her family in this other complicated history. But she then lived in Australia for the next like 30 plus years doing photographic work. And her name is Elaine Siren. And these are kinds of her, uh, like she was exhibiting her photography when I went. And that's her husband, Gordon Siren, who is what people call the father of contemporary Aboriginal art in Australia. Um, this is his painting called Black Ballerina, and he painted it because there's so few representation of um, like black folks in anything, um, but specifically like in ballet. And here in the back is the Sydney Opera House that he just like put there in the back. Um, so I got to know them really well, and they invited me to just like learn more about this history. And so um, when I was there, all of it shifted to no longer trying to learn about Chinese American history, um, but to learning about just like everything else outside of that. But then also having the opportunity when someone told me, like like a Aboriginal poet told me that it doesn't have to be separate. Um, there are Chinese Aboriginal folks that have a huge presence in Australia and that changed everything for me. Um, and made me seek that history out and that artwork out. Um, so, yeah, there is no time, but you should <laughs> Google um, Aboriginal Poetry Open Mic Night, um, and it's on YouTube, and it's the event I went to where a lot of folks uh, shared their artwork to talk about all of these issues um, that I'm talking about. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. One more. Let me end it really quick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, sorry. Um, it's not much of a. Just like in conclusion, um, there's a lot of things that I learned, uh, which is why there's no specific bullet point, but instead there's this beautiful picture um, that I am happy to then talk about uh, during the Q and A. That's it. Um, um, what was your question? Okay. So going back to the Peruvian mm -hmm. experience, um, when you said there was a separation between, say, the 100% full-blooded Chinese who were more recent arrivals in Peru, but there were no 100% Chinese Peruvians from multi-generations. There must be some of those. Mm -hmm. There are. Yeah. And, um, but do you feel that um, here in New York City, say, amongst the um, Chinese American organizations and affiliations, Asian American ones, that we um, have the same uh, racism that you described in Peru, where uh, how pure you are mm -hmm. in blood mm -hmm. um, plays out in, in, in different do you think that's present here? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I can't I can't speak for like every Asian organization that's here, but I would say that that kind of attitude exists, and it's it's not as evident as that. It's not as evident as someone saying like I don't like people that aren't full full blood Chinese. I think it's more evident in how like second gen plus folks are judged um, by how Chinese they are and some of the markers that I've been judged for how Chinese I am is like whether you can use chopsticks and whether you you speak Chinese and then whether your Chinese is accented I think um, those are all just like things that I've been strongly judged by and I think that relates to looking at how there is one pure way to be and then to not be Chinese that negatively affects people, especially if they're multiracial and don't have access to all of those things um, that someone defined as Chinese culture. Could there be a reverse in one could say um, uh, people who are of uh, more uh, mixed uh, blood, since we're talking about the eugenics part of this, that um, uh, 
some people will say they can opt out. They can pass for white. Or they can pass, you know, they, they whereas um, people of 100%, whether they're 100% Afro-American versus Caribbean American, you know, Afro-Caribbean, et cetera, that an individual can opt out depending on how uh, white their complexion is. And that, therefore, there's a little bit of resentment that uh, those who cannot opt out it's, it's, it's a power dynamic, actually, that those who are mixed actually have greater power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think, like, my, the, the way that I'm, I'm seeing it is less about, like, who has more power or privilege because of how they identify, but just more of how people have been excluded. So um, there, can be, there can be stereotypes that exist on both sides. Um, but like the stereotypes that uh, multiracial people might have of Chinese folks won't exclude Chinese folks from identifying as Chinese or like having access to that culture, whereas the discrimination reversed um, right. does. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Landon? Um, what about like, I guess like discrimination like, did the people who were mixed in Peru and Cuba and whatnot um, <laughs> um, experience discrimination from people who were, like, full Peruvian, for example, or, like, full Cuban? I guess, I, I mean, there are multiple races in Cuba, for example, so. Wait, can you repeat your question? Did the um, like, Chinese descendants? So, yeah, did, like, people who were, like, mixed um, race Chinese in, like, Cuba and... Mm -hmm. Peru like experienced discrimination from like most of the people in the rest of the country, mm -hmm. like full Peruvians, etc. Um, I think like there might be the, the typical question that multiracial folks get asked, like like what are you, or like <laughs> just like judgments about mm -hmm. that that they have to explain. Um, so from my understanding in talking with the youth is that they maybe weren't overtly. Um, experiencing racism because of that multiracial identity, but it made them different, and that difference is what caused them to want to delve deeper into what is this Chinese side and like what are my roots. Um, so I would say that they didn't feel like a hundred percent full integration um, into just like every day. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, it helped me, like, it helped me check my own position, like, being someone who is monoracial with, like, full access, maybe, to, like, language and, like, things related to Chinese culture, and then also having such a strong Chinatown and a strong community that I could build with because of that identity. Um, but I would say, like, at the same time, aside from race, it just like having the experience to travel and then to meet these people who I otherwise would have just had to read about in a textbook, it just like changed everything for me. Um, and it changed everything in the sense that, like I realized at one point how at any given time with all of the elderly folks in diaspora playing Chinese chess or mahjong, there's probably like over a thousand games happening at the same time in different <laughs> countries um, that you don't know about. Or there's, it, it like situated everything in America like for me, like sometimes with everything happening under Trump and like with all of this terrible news, it feels like America is caving in. Um, but like where I find hope is knowing that in Ho Chi Minh City, um, like Chinese youth are learning traditional Chinese instruments and like my friends in Peru are meeting every Friday to um, talk about how they can preserve culture. And so it just really expanded um, the idea of hope for me. And also, I was able to see a lot of beautiful places around the world. Um, I was able to go to Machu Picchu. Um, I also went to Huangshan, um, the Yellow Mountains in China. 
I went to the Great Barrier Reef and I learned how to scuba dive. Um, <laughs> these are all just like really fun things on the yeah. side. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, that changed everything for me too in terms of giving me like a bigger perspective. Did you have a question? Uh, maybe sharing some information with you. Uh, in Cuba, uh, Chinatown, uh, with the uh, uh, Chinese opera singers, um, that's a piece of good news, right? Because uh, the, the uh, in terms of preserving uh, history, um, it is done not by Chinese per se, right? Chinese Cubans or Cuban Chinese. Uh, the Chinese uh, opera troupe in, in Cuba is mostly Cubans. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a documentary film on the whole troupe that actually took place, and then they went back to China to perform. Okay. That's a, it's done by a Canadian uh, photographer. And uh, it's a beautiful hour and a half uh, film. Uh, it, it's it, it's an interview, we you know, the interviews, and uh, as you have learned, that uh, the singers are they don't speak Chinese, mm -hmm. but they know the songs, mm -hmm. they know the movement, mm -hmm. and they found uh, a, s a small uh, uh, collection of old, uh, you know, costumes that they, they actually perform with. Mm -hmm. And so this hope, right? Uh, even even the, even though the Chinese themselves are no longer there to preserve it, because the history and the impact to the locals were enough. Mm -hmm. that it makes a, a, a very strong um, feeling for them. And so they did it, they preserved it. So this photographer who, uh, uh, from Canada, um, he did similar things like you did. He just did, went down and took pictures, taking pictures, and then discovered that there's no Chinese there, but they were singers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had this book and did this film. Uh, so check it out, it's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Cool. What is it called? I'll, I'll show okay, you. I'll just I'll just Google yeah. Chinese Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, piece of uh, documentary. Yeah. Um, and I think it was done maybe oh five six years ago. Mm -hmm. And one interesting that I wanted to share about the um, Chinese opera singers is that um, the women I shared pictures of who grew up in Havana, they were actually trained since they were six to eight years old to do Cantonese opera. And the reason for that was the current people in the Cantonese opera troops were leaving with troops to go to the US to perform mm. where they could make more money. And so there was a shortage of Cantonese opera even though there was a huge demand for it. Um, and then the other thing was that the impression of Havana Chinatown is that there are no Chinese left from the locals there and also from people who visit, but this really um, is like a disrespect to the multiracial Chinese Cuban elderly folks who are doing all of the work mm -hmm. to make sure Chinatown continues. Mm -hmm. Even if there's no clear lineage um, that will follow their work, they're all just like super dedicated to it. I think um, I, I have thought about that a lot. Um, if I would have done anything different, had circumstances been different, um, but I have realized, um, and what helped me realize that was I went back to Cuba this December. Like I came home in the end of September, but I went back to Cuba in December because I really wanted to see people and because um, I had the chance to share my work at the University of Havana. And like before doing that, um, I had thought about how like had I been able to have the chance to do this again, I would have gotten a better camera with like better mics. Um, I was like a one person camera person and interviewer. Um, I I think like 
in <clears throat> hindsight, I would have had the time to make all of the connections that I eventually did beforehand, like if I were to do it again. Um, but then when I was in Cuba, like I realized how the realities really change depending on where you're living. And so when I'm here, I can reflect on all of that. But then I went back to Havana and I realized like there's still no internet access that's really easy um, for me to have been able to look up all of the information I wanted to look up. Um, even though I had a better camera, things were still so hectic in the everyday that I still didn't have time to sit with people and interview them as much as I would have because there's just so much going on. Um, so I've been trying to reconcile how I can make do with all of what I have collected and try to archive it from there rather than like regretting that things weren't perfect um, in each country. Did you bring them back some lockdown? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I posted a Facebook status like a couple days before I went and I was like, does anyone want to donate uh, $5 for me to buy a bunch of Chinese goods? And people donated. Thank you everyone on Facebook who donated. I got like $200 to buy little tiger bombs for about like 70 seniors and also like 70 lap churn <laughs> and a lot of Chinese goodies. Um, so I went and they were really happy to receive it, but then like they were also like, you didn't bring any plums. And I was like, sorry. Yeah, but for me, I just like saw how much they appreciated like little tins of Tiger Bomb, not even for like the use for it necessarily, but just like the memory and like the smell of it and just like the smell and the texture of lobster too. So if anyone ever goes to Cuba, like you can bring stuff there and then go to Chinatown and if you see a Chinese person, they're involved with the associations and you can just <laughs> tell them to share it amongst each other, like they're really appreciative of that. <laughs> and, and tourists do do that. Like when I went back in December, um, Canadian tourists did that, like they came with a suitcase full of Chinese goodies for people. Aww. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing your stories. I feel like I learned so much and it was really moving. Um, for the sake of time, I know you kind of have to summarize your experiences at the end, but um, you're back to Singapore and Chinese, so I would be curious about like, if you're able to learn anything from your time in Singapore that you could tie to your experiences here. Um, it's okay if it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I think like from my time in Singapore what I just learned is that sometimes it's not really about race and like what race is in power but it's about like I guess like how people think about power when they're in power um, and how Chinese people in Singapore and in other countries in Southeast Asia really need to check themselves um, and I guess like do more work that's in line with the issues that immigrant folks um, from other countries are facing. Um, and I guess like another thing I've been thinking about is I had heard, I, I had seen a book and heard a rumor somewhere that before Columbus, um, Chinese people were also trying to like do whatever Columbus did and like, like travel in search of trade routes and things like that. And so sometimes I think about um, how things could have been really different if like that Chinese person beat Christopher Columbus to it. Um, and, and how like China thought of itself as like the middle kingdom and the center of everything, right? And how now there's still so much power and also racism about how Han Chinese people treat um, other ethnic groups in China. Um, so race just gets really complicated and it's not as easy as saying like, I'm Chinese American, so I've been discriminated against because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, it's like super complicated. Um, so that's what I took away. Okay, like one final question. Um, does anyone have something burning? Yeah. Uh, if you had another month to travel, where would you go next? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I. I think I would, I really wanted to go to um, Papua New Guinea. Um, and I had learned in Australia that um, some indigenous groups like interacted with Chinese laborers way back when. And so <coughs> their language has Chinese influence. 
Um, so if I had more time and more resources, um, I'd, I'd probably investigate into that and like the intersections between um, Chinese and indigenous identity. Yeah. Cool. Um, so thank you everyone for joining me tonight. Um, one thing I will say is I'm looking for people who are interested to help support the project in any way, whether that is transcribers or web designers um, or video editors. Um, and I think like if you want, I'm, I'm trying to put together a poetry collection within the next year, um, just like self-published related to this and also just my own work. Um, so if you want to leave your name or like interest in some way, um, I'd love to collect that info. And then I guess the final thing is um, we have a story corner over there where Emma is with a camera where we are, oh, over there, somewhere, somewhere in the corner, in an actual corner, um, in, in this corner over there where we're inviting folks to share stories of home and like where you find home and what it looks like or just like reactions or comments um, to what were shared here. And throughout the Homeward Bound series events, uh, we're going to have that stable story corner to collect uh, leading up to our open mic and then potential um, future zine or publications we'll put together with all of our stories. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it.